In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high has broken upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Welcome to our circuit service for today, the fourth Sunday in Epiphany, the 30th of January 2022. Whoever you are, wherever you're tuning in from, and whatever time of the week you're tuning in, you're really welcome. We're glad that you're here to worship alongside us. For our service today, I thought that I would take the text for Candlemas. That's not until the 2nd of February, Wednesday of this coming week, but close enough maybe for us to think about today. So what is Candlemas? Well, among the many holy feasts in the Christian calendar, the Feast of the Presentation, or the Feast of the Purification of the Virgin Mary, or Candlemas Day, is the oldest, celebrated since the 4th century AD in Jerusalem. Observation of this event spread to other eastern cities and into Europe by the middle of the 5th century the custom of observing the festival with lighted candles was introduced and the name Candlemas derived from this. It's a feast being increasingly observed by different denominations and some churches often leave their nativities and their displays in place until the Feast of Candlemas. So maybe today is a day for lighting your candles and thinking about Jesus as the light of the world. We're going to begin with a hymn based on that theme, Light of the World, You Step Down Into Darkness, we sing. Thank you. 
And now let us pray. This is a prayer attributed to St Francis of Assisi. You are holy, O Lord, the only God, and your deeds are wonderful. You are strong, you are great, you are the Most High. You, Holy Father, are the King of heaven and earth. You are three and one, Lord God, all good. You are love, you are wisdom, you are humility, you are endurance, you are rest, you are peace. You are joy and gladness. You are justice and moderation. You are all our riches and you suffice for us. You are beauty. You are gentleness. You are our protector. You are our guardian and defender. You are courage. You are our haven and hope. You are our faith our great consolation, our eternal life, great and wonderful Lord, God Almighty, merciful Saviour. Amen. And a prayer of confession. Lord God, in these quiet moments we bring to you now our regrets, our sins of omission and commission, our frailty and our faults. We thank you that you draw us into the circle of your mercy, into the transforming renewal of your forgiveness, into the opportunity of a new beginning, lived in your power and blessed through your grace. And a collect for Candlemas. May the flame of your love never be quenched in our hearts, O Lord. Waking or sleeping, living or dying, may we delight in your presence. Let the flame of your love brighten our souls and illumine our path. And may the majesty of your glory be our joy, our life and our strength, now and for ever. Amen. One of the poets whose writings I appreciate is Malcolm Geith, and he has a blog, not quite a daily blog, but one on which he uploads poetry that he has written and thoughts and reflections. And he writes this, Candlemas is the day when we realise that eternity can come into time and touch us in the form of a tiny child that God appears at last in his temple, not as some transcendent overlord, but as a vulnerable pilgrim coming in his love to walk the road of life alongside us. And Malcolm Geith has written a poem entitled Candlemas. They came as called according to the law Though they were poor and had to keep things simple, they moved in grace, in quietness, in awe, for God was coming with them to his temple. Amidst the outer court's commercial bustle, they'd waited hours, enduring shouts and shoves, buyers and sellers, sensing one more hustle had made a killing on the two young doves. They come at last with us to Candlemas and keep the day the prophecies came true. We glimpse with them amid our busyness the peace that Simeon and Anna knew. For Candlemas still keeps his kindred light. Against the dark, our Saviour's face is bright. Marvellous. And now a reading from the Gospels that gives us that story, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 to 40. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to, the, to Jerusalem 
to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the light of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marvelled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess. Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Thanks be to God for that reading from his word. That reading gives us one of the few stories of Jesus' infancy, his dedication in the temple, where we meet Simeon and Anna, two prophetic figures of ancient wisdom whose role for Luke is to place the child Jesus within the long traditions and promises of Israel's history. So Mary and Joseph had circumcised their child on the eighth day, as Torah required, and they named the child Jesus, as Mary had been told by Gabriel. And then 40 days after the birth, they go up to Jerusalem, to the temple, for Mary's purification and to make the necessary offering, again, in accordance with the Torah. You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 12. We should give some thought as to how Luke constructs and bookends his gospel with references to the temple and Jerusalem. Luke's gospel begins in the temple with Zechariah and ends in the temple with the disciples praising God after Jesus' ascension. And the first two chapters as well, about Jesus' birth and childhood, again end in the temple with Jesus talking with the teachers of the law. And here, just before that scene, is another scene in the temple. And what all this means is that just as the temple was the place of encounter between Israel and God, and was the place where the law that enshrined the covenant between God and the people was located. So now Jesus is all of those things. Jesus is the new temple. He is the place of encounter. He is the embodiment of the covenant. He is the fulfillment of the law. He is the redeemer who takes away the sins of the world. 
So this passage then is about fulfilment, about renewal and about encounter with God and it's all located in Jesus. This holy family is devout and observant and they're poor so their offering is simple just two turtle doves instead of a lamb but they are also offering or presenting their child Jesus the Lamb of God. They must have been in a reverent even solemn mood that day the way young parents are now when their child is to be baptized. In the temple, at least in the outer court where women were allowed, they encounter two old saints who represent Israel in miniature and Israel at its best, devout, obedient, constant in prayer, led by the Holy Spirit, at home in the temple, longing and hoping for the fulfilment of God's purposes. Luke tells us that Simeon has been assured by the Holy Spirit that he won't die until he sees the Messiah, so he clearly has an indwelling power. He knows that God has wonderful things in store and that although these things are not going to be achieved by or even through him, he will witness them. He's patient and he has humility and he believes that the future is bigger than the past. And sure enough, when the big moment arrives, Simeon has the insight to recognise what he's been waiting for all along. What he holds may be just a baby, but what he sees is the salvation of God, glory for the people Israel and a light for the Gentiles, not just from long ago, but for today, and not just for himself and his people, but for all peoples. And like Mary and Zechariah before her, Simeon breaks into a beautiful song, praising God and asking to be released from his waiting for the consolation of Israel, for he has now beheld the miracle before his very eyes and he says he can now die in peace. And this reminds us that salvation is something that we are able to see. We behold God's salvation with our own eyes. What does that look like? Do we recognise it when we see it? Simeon saw salvation in the face of Jesus and he was given the insight to recognise the dawning of a new era. My eyes have seen your saving deed, he says, displayed for all people to see, a revealing of the light for the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. But then Simeon goes on. He tells how the child will affect Mary's life in the years ahead. And his song is sharply political, talking about the rising and falling of nations and it seems a little like Mary's song, the Magnificat. His song is Simeon's gift to Mary, his insight that Mary will have to struggle with a growing awareness of, as to who her child is, and she will have to watch as she sees the effect Jesus has on a whole range of people, from his own disciples to crowds of strangers and those who would eventually kill him. This painting by 15th century Italian artist Giovanni Bellini depicts a very private scene and it seems to be the moment when Mary hears Simeon's painful prophecy that her son will be rejected and pain will be like a sword driven through her soul. And as Joseph frowns at Simeon's words, words no parent would want to hear, Mary, so young, looks down thoughtfully, holding her child close. The painting is an extraordinary insight into the commitment and conflict that are part of Mary's motherhood. 
There's a sense that when we think of Mary, we perhaps think of her as some uncritical supporter of everything her son does in life, cheering him on as if she didn't have a mind of her own. Yet Mary is a mother who has to watch as her son takes a dangerous path and makes dangerous enemies. Does she, I wonder, try to persuade him to be more tactful when he speaks with the Pharisees? or to keep a low profile around the leaders of the temple. We know from Mark's Gospel, at one point Jesus' family believes that Jesus has lost his mind. And Simeon's words come as a warning that the choices Mary's son will make, the friends he will gather around him, his abiding love for the last, the least and the lost, the upside-down values he will profess and the enemies he will attract will all cause her pain. When Mary said yes to the angel, she could not have known all that that would mean, how years later she would cradle her son in his death as she had in his birth. And yet Mary kept her promise and all that it meant in spite of everything. As well as Simeon, there's another witness in the temple courts that day, the prophetess Anna, who is carefully described by Luke. He tells us her tribe, her age and her background. And given this amount of detail, it's a pity that Luke doesn't also tell us what she says as she gives thanks to God and talks about the child to everyone around but Luke has given her her place in the story. She and Simeon represent all the watching faithful, the elders and the elderly, the waiting and the praying ones, who keep hope alive for the rest of us. And in the temple that day, they found themselves standing on the threshold of heaven, witnessing God's promised salvation. At our own baptism, a candle is given to us as a sign that Christ is our light and companion throughout our life. And maybe a thought from our text today might be that every day, every minute, it is as though Mary is placing Jesus into our arms for us to recognise and cherish and share with the world. Simeon and Anna spent their lives preparing for the moment when they would come face to face with God in Christ, and when it came, they were ready. Perhaps that's our question too. What are we preparing for? And when it comes, will we be ready? And all these many years after the events St Luke's records, we continue to sing Simeon's song, simply because it tells of God's great love for us, a love that nothing, not upheaval, not uncertain days ahead, not even death can destroy. For like Simeon, we also need to see and hear and touch and feel God's promise and know that with the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, we need no longer be afraid. We will have personal trials to face, of course. Peace on earth may not be here just yet, but in the birth of the Christ child so long ago, we have seen salvation. The light has come into the world and the darkness shall not overcome it. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing a wonderful hymn now, Come down, O love divine.
Last week, on the 27th of January, we remembered Holocaust Memorial Day. And although many of our local commemorations did not take place this year, there is a national service on the Holocaust Memorial Day website, which you can watch in retrospect. The theme for this year is One Day. Ibi Nil, survivor of the Holocaust, said of that awful time, You didn't think about yesterday, and tomorrow might not happen. It was only today that you had to cope with, and you got through it as best you could. So we're going to use the theme one day for our prayers of intercession as we pray for the world which God loves and came to share with us in our joys and struggles. So let us pray. Creator God, we pray for the Eastern Mediterranean region where snowfall has disrupted life for internally displaced people in camps in Syria. In just one day, the little shelter they had to call home was destroyed. But we pray that this may be the day that they find some compassion and relief for their suffering. We pray for those who are still crossing or trying to cross the border between Myanmar and Thailand. We pray that this may be the one day they are able to reach a place of safety. We pray for women in Guatemala who celebrate their judicial victory in gender violence cases over half a century. And we pray that one day will bring peace and equality to all who suffer any form of gender violence and abuse. We pray for those in New Zealand and other countries as they again tighten COVID-19 restrictions and especially those whose life events, weddings, baptisms, birthdays and funerals are disrupted. We pray that they and others across the world may find one day their special day is marked. We pray for Afghanistan as at the conclusion of the next steps talks. We pray that every day the people of Afghanistan would receive food, medical aid and shelter. May this be the day that they have some hope. We pray for the discovery and protection of new ecosystems like the giant pristine coral reef that has been discovered off the coast of Tahiti. And we pray that one day very soon we will see a genuine, global and committed response to climate care. We pray for those among our family and friends who suffer sickness and loss. And we pray that this day they may be comforted and strengthened, that this day they may know that others who love them are praying for them, and that this day they may have the assurance that you are a God who accompanies, who brings peace, and who blesses with love. Simeon and Anna have reminded us of the blessing and the contribution of older people faithful witnesses among us of hope and patience. We give thanks for those who have helped us to recognise your presence among us and we ask that this day they may know your encouragement and your peace. As we pray with these examples to focus our prayers and our thoughts, we remember that everywhere these events repeat and recur, and that one day remains the hope and prayer for people of justice and compassion everywhere. So for all people, we ask that their one day of decision, of achievement, of rescue, 
of release will come. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Candlemas is sometimes spoken of as the day when the church's year changes direction. We stop looking back to Christmas and Epiphany and we begin to look forward to Lent and Good Friday and Easter. It's also nature's growing time of the year, a season that will offer us plenty of opportunity to practice and grow in wisdom. So that like Anna and Simeon, we might recognise the moments of God's coming and delight in God's love every day. We're going to share now in a wonderful version of Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. It's um, the musical version written by Howard Goodall and it comes from Matt Beckington and the National Methodist Church Choir. I hope you enjoy it. Visit us with thy salvation. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee. Praise the hymn. Let's sing.
and now a blessing. Circle us, O God, keep us from harm and grant us protection. Circle us, O God, keep us from darkness and grant us light. Circle us, O God, keep us from despair and grant us hope. Circle us, O God, keep us from turmoil and grant us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.